Let there be praise, let there be joy in our hearts. Sing to the Lord, give Him the glory, glory. Let there be praise, let there be joy. Happy Easter to everybody today. Happy Easter. Guess what? Our Jesus is up. He is Amen. risen. Ain't that the truth? Amen. Amen. Give him a hand, man. He's sure. I tell you what. Whew. Aren't you glad he did that today? He loves us that much. Mm -mm -mm. Hey, let's pray and let our pastor get up here for a minute or two. Lord, thank you. Oh, my goodness alive. We thank you for coming out of that grave and going with the Father, Lord, and we thank you for doing that. Thank you for loving us so much that you did it. And Lord, today, while you're there, Lord, just bless each person that's here. Pray that you'll bless our pastor, give him every word that we need to hear once again, that we'll take them and know that we'll use them to help somebody else this week. And then also, Lord, in Sunday school this morning, we called up quite a few people again that needed help. Uh, they need a touch from you. So today, Lord, we ask him once again if you would reach down and touch each one of these people, Lord. So we thank you for that. But thank you, my goodness, the Lord, for just loving us, for doing what you did. And uh, what we want to do is today, we just want to praise you all day long, Lord, and just tell you that we love you. And we're going to ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to share a secret with you that most of the world doesn't understand. He's alive. Amen. Let's give him another hand. Amen. Aren't the flowers beautiful? They really are. These flowers actually are a gift from uh, Harmon and Glenda Summers, a memory of her mother, uh, Luelle Sadler, whom I had the pleasure of pastoring years ago. She went home to be with the Lord. And, of course, also in honor of their new addition to their family. And I always wonder why people get so excited about grandkids. Two reasons. They're almost over their children. <laughs> and they're moving on to somebody else, right? And this is Emily Rose. So thank you for the flowers and appreciate so much you being here. We're going to receive the offering and then we'll take, make the rest, of the, uh, rest of the announcements quickly after that. So, gentlemen... Come and let's receive the offering, please. Brother Gene Rutledge, would you lead us to the Lord, please?
Well, if your motor isn't cranked already, you probably need a rebuilt one. You guess? How many woke up this morning thinking, my goodness alive, we get to celebrate the life of Jesus Christ one more day corporately throughout the whole world, maybe at different places and different times, but everybody's Christians that are celebrating, many of them are celebrating by giving their life because of their testimony for Jesus Christ. So remember to pray for those that are, most of you know, we lost several of our students in Kenya, two of the Bible students that were at the uh, Believer's Bible Institute there in Kenya. We know that so far they haven't been found. They're assumed that they're dead, but there was 148 slaughtered there. And this is only about 100 miles from Nairobi where Michael is there. So remember to continue to pray for those needs that are there. Let me make several announcements and we'll get right on into the service. Don't forget Vacation Bible School. It's an exciting time around here. We start announcing it early. July the 13th through 17th. A ladies' luncheon, April the 18th at 11.30, and that's the Tomato Cafe. I'm assuming that's in Havana. Okay, 11.30 a.m. You don't have to eat tomatoes, but you get to go to the Tomato Cafe, okay? Also, don't, don't forget right after the service today, the ladies usually meet on this side of the church and have prayer. So don't forget those things. There will not be an evening service. I want you to spend time with your family. Go home and do whatever you do on, on Resurrection Day. By the way... And I know this is hard for you to learn all over again. We say it every year. We don't celebrate Easter here. We celebrate Resurrection Day. Amen. Easter is, is, a, is actually a pagan holiday. We, most of us know that. But what happened early in, in church history, the church decided in order to overshadow their pagan holiday, they would celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And by the way, the resurrection of Christ, that's why the church meets on the first day of the week. Every week, we meet together to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not just on Resurrection Day. So, celebrate with us today. We're looking for a great time in the Lord. Don't forget, there will not be Bible Institute tonight, as we've always said. Latest Bible study will be held Monday. Don't forget it at 6.30 here at the church. And then don't forget the Bible study in Havana uh, on Tuesday evening at Faith Funeral Home. Some of you have been attending. Yes, ma'am. No ladies Bible study this month. Okay, I know that Keith and Connie are over in uh, Alabama with Leah, and they were supposed to put out 5,000 eggs out of a helicopter over there. <laughs> you know, I've, I've heard of bunnies laying eggs, but I've never heard of helicopters laying them. But I'm learning every day, right? So, and by the way, if you're visiting with us this morning, we hope your visit to be pleasant. I pray that you've already had somebody come by and shake your hand and let you know how important you are for being here with us. And I've about made up my mind. I think that probably what we need to do, to be fair, is alternate. I think every Sunday, every other Sunday, ought to be homecoming. And every other alternate sermon needs to be Resurrection Day. Don't you think so? Amen. So we're going to change the schedule. No, I'm kidding. We're, we'll be here, though. We'll be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord every Sunday. So you come and be with us. And by the way, if we can ever help you or whatever, I hope that you'll find, pick up one of the bulletins, has all of our phone numbers, how to contact us, so feel free to do so. And let's celebrate the Lord right now and just relax and see what God has for us. And Brother Tony, come on. Okay, once again, it's your turn. We're going to go sit down and y'all going to come up here. No, just stand up and sing with me. How about that? Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred hand for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burning of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I 
Christ the rose. Yes, he did.
through Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Hallelujah. It's great to be here and everybody here. Perhaps one of the greatest things that happened in the Bible happened today. Because without this, everything we do would just be a lie. So I sing this. I sing this for my father who rose today. But I pray that this blesses your heart.
way I'm dead and gone But you will see You were wrong Go ahead Try and hide the sun If that doesn't stir you, something's wrong inside. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to turn our kids loose to joy celebration. So all of you that are, I see them already on the run. Boy, I'll tell you what. If you missed the egg hunt yesterday, you missed a great thing. Those kids had a great time here. And we appreciate all the hard work that went into having the egg hunt. I was especially gratified by some of the things that was said. I have some uh, handouts here for BBF Africa Sponsorship Renewal. It's time again to renew our commitment to the orphans. Um, this year is probably one of the greatest challenges that we're going to have because as I just said, the, uh, the extremists are moving steadily toward, on toward Kenya, down into Nairobi, and of course eventually uh, probably the entire uh, nation of Kenya, but be remembering to pray. And what I have here, and I'm got, not going to pass them out because I think it would be easier. I'm just going to have someone put these out on, in the foyer. And if you would, uh, Brother Steve, um, then sign up if you would like to continue contributing. This is $20 a month for uh, each orphan that we help support. And if you haven't been doing it and you'd like to do it, we certainly need your support. And uh, about 250 orphans that mainly what support they get is out of this church. And now you've got to think about that. <laughs> I mean, we're a little Highway 20 church, but somebody forget we don't have a Highway 20 God. He's bigger than all of us put together. And uh, someone told me earlier today, and this is, I love great events like this. And Leonard Haney, step to the front right there. That young man is celebrating 50 years of marriage today with his blessed wife. Amen. <laughs> I normally don't do that, but I tell you, that just proves there is a God. She's put up with him for all those years. What a great joy. Oh, me. Resurrection Day. What a wonderful time for the children of God. What a time to get together and just say, you know, thank God He's alive, I'm alive. Without Him, there would be instant death. And there'd be no thing after death. There would just be a, not nothing, but no thing after death. It'd be like animals. We'd die as someone said. Now someone said, well, you know, I believe my animal's in heaven. If you want to believe that, just have yourself. I know there are animals in a millennium, but I'll, I'll, I, we won't get into that. <laughs> I tell you what, if you love your animal, love them while they're here. And then you may get a chance to love them again. I don't know. But one thing about it, those that trust Jesus Christ will be there. And we will celebrate. 
I, I think about this sometimes. When we get to heaven, there won't be any restraints. I mean, you know, nothing to, nothing to worry about what somebody sitting next to us is going to think about us if we get a little excited or, or if we just sit there, you know, with our arms crossed and saying, you know, I shall not be moved. Well, it's all right. It's all right. It doesn't matter. We're different people. We celebrate God different ways. So you don't have to do it like everybody else does. I don't know where that came from anyway. You have a right to worship God your way. And it's between you and Him. It's not between me and you or me and the church. You know, some people choose to worship one way and one another. But the main part is you've got to know who you're worshiping before you worship. And that's what the resurrection is all about. I want you to take your Bibles and go with me over to the book of Matthew. We'll be in chapter 27, verse 57 is where we'll start. But I want to run something by you, just kind of give us a, a background. For the last 10 days, Jerusalem has been a totally different city. It hasn't been the normal ebb and flow of business being done at the gate and people entering in in a normal kind of capacity. Because 10 days ago, from the resurrection day there in Jerusalem, an unusual thing happened. You remember hearing about the rebel from Galilee? You know, the one who claimed to be God and God's Son and His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And an unusual thing happened that day. All of a sudden, you could hear the crowds crying outside the gate, Hosanna! Hosanna! And this rebel Jesus, of all the nerve, came riding in on a lowly donkey in through the gates of Jerusalem. And when he got inside, the strangest thing happened. He went to the temple area. And there inside the court, he found the money changers who apparently were selling things that were to be used in sacrifice inside the temple. Well, what he found is he found that they were money changers. They were changing their money for temple money, which was the only thing you could use. And what they were doing were charging exorbitant prices. To make a long story short, they were crooks and robbers. So Jesus made him a plat, a whip. And the Bible doesn't say that he hit anybody, but it says that they had the idea he meant business and they left. Turned their tables over. And the whole city was in an uproar. What in the world's going on? This strange man that claims all of these things. And of course later, because of his preaching and declaring that there was going to be a king, and of course the Romans denied that anyone could be king or in charge except the Roman government themselves. And so later he was arrested. Insurrection was the charge that he was plotting to overthrow the government. And of course, false witnesses came forth. They declared, yes, we heard him say this. In fact, one said he had the audacity to say that in three days he was going to tear the temple down. In three days it would be rebuilt again. All of these claims that absolutely couldn't be impossible. In fact, only God could do the things he claimed. You're absolutely right. They got one thing right. And so the story as it unfolds, we find Jesus standing before the Sanhedrin with all of the accusations being made and of course false witnesses being brought and the end results was he was found guilty. The only sinless man was found guilty by a human court made up of sinful men. And they declared... Of course, the curator wanted to turn him loose. He did not want the pressure of those around him, the political pressure. He didn't want them to say, you know, what he, would, he had actually slaughtered a, a man that there was no actual real charge against. He said, I find no fault in him. So he said, you know, we have a custom once a year that we'll release one. And of course, the people cried out, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Barabbas, of course, being that thief. And of course, the crowd chose much like today, they chose what they wanted instead of what God wanted for them. And they said, well, what should we do then with this man named Jesus? And the cry grew louder. Crucify Him! Crucify Him! A man who'd done no sin. There was no guile in His mouth. 
And they nailed him to a place on a cross at a place called Calvary. And Jesus had told them over and over, had told his disciples over and over, I'm going to die and I'm going to be buried, but three days later I will rise again. Told them over and over. Many times if we don't have spiritual ears, we only hear what we see, not what we hear. I'll give you a wonderful example when we get there. Three days later, of course, can you see death and hell celebrating when Jesus was placed in the tomb? Can you see them celebrating all the demons getting around having a party at Joe's Bar and Grill? Just celebrating in all sense. Finally, this, this troublemaker is out of our sight. <laughs> I can see rigor mortis. I got him. Don't worry. I'm beginning to set in. He won't get away from me. About the third day, Riggy looked over at death and said, something's happening here. Death says, what do you mean? Rigor mortis says, I'm losing my grip. And of course, we know just a few days later, or a few hours later, he didn't just lose his grip. It probably lost his mind. Jesus got up and walked out. Verse 57, when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and he laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, the other Mary being mother of, of James the Less, sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day, which was the Sabbath now, that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priest Paris, Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remembered that that deceiver, you know what, it's a wonder God didn't knock him out. That deceiver said, While he was yet alive after he said this. After three days I will rise again. Uh, command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day. Lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And they say unto the people. He is risen from the dead. So the last era shall be worse than the, than the first. By the way still many people believe that. Pilate said unto him. You have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure. Sealing the stone and setting the watch. They placed the seal of the governor on the stone. Therefore, anyone that broke that seal would be guilty of treason. So he made the stone sealed. Chapter 28 is where I left the start. I would have left the other out. Because the Bible said in the end of the Sabbath, this is sundown Saturday now. Time has rolled on. The city is quietened. There's no roar anymore. Everything's going back to regular business. It's kind of like church services. You know, Sunday we come in and we, we do our religious duty or whatever it is. You know, we feel like we've, we've done what we need to come. We've come to get fed. We've come to fellowship, whatever. And if we aren't careful, we'll leave the presence of what we... By the way, God doesn't just live in a building. Aren't you glad? He lives in His people. But when we leave here, we should be as excited about Him then as we are now. Why do we just get excited when we come to church? That doesn't make any sense at all. Amen? I don't think there's anything wrong with being excited at church, but if that's all there is to it, then you might better want to think about what causes that. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, remember this is mother of James the less, and to see the sepulcher. It came back. They, were, they couldn't get the spices that they needed to continue the burial. So they waited after the Sabbath. Of course, they couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. They had to wait till they come back to the first day of the week. And this is when they started back toward the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Now this is the second earthquake since Jesus' crucifixion. I personally believe that this was probably just relegated right to that immediate area around the tomb. And it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Can you get a vision of that? He's just sitting on the rock waiting on them to say something. 
Here's a messenger waiting to find out what his message should be. He already has the message. But see, no matter what message we have, unless we have people that are willing to hear, the message dies inside the messenger. And he was sitting there and he says, His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. Now, I don't know about you, but that would, I would have had a 911 standing there seeing that. I, that would have got my attention. And for fear of him, the keepers, those that had the charge of keeping the tomb sealed, <laughs> they said, man, I'm out of here. I, I, they can do what they want to, but that didn't happen. Look what happened. The Bible said, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Literally, it means they actually became unconscious. They didn't know what was going on around them. And it might have been a good thing for them even. But the one thing that they're going to remember, and the Bible doesn't go into detail here, so I won't, but I'm convinced since I'm doing the preaching, I believe that they, they would never get over what happened to them at the tomb. There would be a witness forever in their mind that this tomb was, that the stone was rolled back. And by the way, he knew that if Jesus was alive, he did not need the stone rolled back for him to get out. He needed the stone rolled back for us to get in. To see and validate the fact that he wasn't there anymore. So the Bible says, They were afraid, and the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus. In a beautiful statement, which was crucified, and where is he now in their mind? Where is he? Here's a wonderful truth here. The only thing they knew is where they left him. They knew that he had died. They saw him die on the cross. And they knew that he'd been placed inside the sepulcher, inside the cave. And they came back to finish their burying. But little, they forgot the most important thing. And here's misplaced faith. They had faith in what they saw, but they didn't have faith in what he said. He said, I'm going to rise again the third day. And when they came there, of course... He wasn't there. Listen to what the angel said. He is not here. Then where is he? In my mind, the first thing I thought, well, tell me where he is. And he said, here's what's happened. He is risen. As he said. Remember, you know, it's amazing. We get all these things together and forget what God said. That's why we have a Bible. Amen? We don't have to take what somebody else says God says. We got it right before us. Here's what he said. He said it, and he is risen as he said. And then he said, I want to show you the proof. Come see the place where the Lord lay. What led up to all of this? Thirty-three and a half years old about at this point in time. For the last three years, he had been preaching throughout all of the area around that he was the Messiah. He was the coming one. The Jews had been waiting now for years, waiting on the Messiah to come. And the, the, all the prophets of old had foretold the coming of a Messiah that would redeem Israel and set her free. But they were looking on the other side. They were looking for someone who would come in as a dictator, as a governor, would overthrow the Roman government and take over the Israel government. And Israelis once more would rule the land of the Palestines. Of course, they were looking for something earthly. And he was going to give them something spiritual. Not earthy at all. So he said, please. I want you when you come and see what's here. And we find in another place in the Gospels. That of course two of the apostles came back. And they found the linen that had wrapped him in. The grave clothes had been removed. And the napkin that was over his face was laid in one place. And the others were laid faithfully up there. And of course immediately they understood. When Jesus got up the first thing he did is he took the napkin and laid it over to one side. Unwrapped himself from the grave clothes and laid them in another. And then just walked out. I don't know about you, but that gives me Holy Ghost bumps. He got up and left. The worst that man could do to him was not enough to hold him down. And by the way, all the things that are happening now, a lot of people are eroding with fear. We know that things are different today, even in America, than they've ever been before. We know that there's a challenge that's going on, especially in foreign countries, that are, are being persecution unto death. For many Christians, and even our very government has become, we've become the enemy of the state. 
Why? Because we're considered radical. We believe a Bible. We believe there's God. And there's every move in the world right now. So our battle, as much as anything else, is the battle of compromise and absolutely just playing the religious game. That's our worst enemy. When we go through the motions without a living Savior, so many people have, 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 have talked to me about what do we should do with all the things that are going on. And listen, I want to tell you something. Our battle and our weapons are not of this world. Our weapons are prayer and faith and love. That's what God gave us to do battle with. Some say, well, we need to do this and do that. I believe that Christians just need to get where we need to be. Somebody say amen with me. I believe that's our victory because we have a risen Lord. We don't have to go fight a physical battle uh, in order to so supposedly win. We don't need to, to, to use the elements of the world to try to win the battle that God gave us the spiritual weapons to do it with. I think there's two things that needs to happen to the church proper. And that is, first of all, to make sure you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you don't, no matter where you are, you're hopeless. Unless you surrender to that. But the other side is those who know Christ... We find it hard to be so committed to the things of God because the world has so many things that attracts us and draws us away. And by the way, we're all tempted. Say amen. I, some people want to act so spiritual. I'm not as spiritual as some of y'all. I'm tempted from time to time. Amen. But as long as God gives me the grace to keep going in the right direction and doing the right things, for one reason, I have a living Lord living inside of me. And He's the one that gets the glory, not us. And so he continues the thought and says, He's not here, He's risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell His disciples that He is risen from the dead. And behold, He goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see Him. Lo, I have told you, the message is over. Can you imagine that maybe they wanted to, after they took that message and left, to go tell the disciples. Can you imagine that maybe they said, is that really what he said? Maybe we can go back. No, no, the message was done. The message was sealed. There was a period put on the end of that message. What he was saying, this is all I have to say. This is what he told me to tell you. By the way, they knew what Christ had said, even in his teachings. They saw the miracles that God used to validate the fact that that was his son. Jesus didn't come down here to put on a horse and pony show for the world. God used those miracles and great signs to validate the fact that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And knowing that, he said, go tell his disciples. Why? Because his disciples was the hope for the world. You and I, as His disciples today, are the hope for the world. Isn't that scary? We are. We're the ones that God left uh, spiritually in charge of what He's doing. So He said, go tell His disciples that, that you shall see Him in Galilee. Now, we know that He saw Him several times before He got to Galilee. But there was a special meeting that's going to be going on in Galilee. In verse 8, the Bible said, and they departed quickly. I would have too, would you not? from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. Can you see those two mixed together? Fear and yet great joy. But I think they were so afraid that God had revealed in such a, a powerful manner the message that they had to carry. And don't you think they may have been overwhelmed with the fact that they had been entrusted with such a message to go back to His disciples? Like we have been trusted with a message. And the world, by the way, everybody thinks the whole world knows the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I, would, I would say, and I believe this with all my heart, I believe a lot of the world knows a sort of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you and I have the Bible, and that's what we need to give them. Just the truth. And leave the rest to God. And so, verse 9 says, And they went to tell His disciples, and as they went to tell His disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. I love that word. It literally means, Be cheerful. Y'all didn't hear me. Be cheerful. Oh, I'm not talking about happy. Happy goes up and down with your emotions. 
cheerfulness and joy happens when it's placed in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said through Paul, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I tell you, rejoice. So when Jesus spoke, He said, Hey guys, uh, paraphrasing please, Hey guys, we got a reason to be excited. we got a reason to be cheerful. I'm alive. I did not stay in the tomb as they said I would. Be not afraid. Let's go back to verse 9. When He said, All hail, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Wow. They knew he was alive. He showed himself to him, them. And then when he fell, they fell down before him and wrapped their arms around his feet and just began to worship him. The rest of the verse says, verse 10, And then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. He knew what was ahead of these guys. Do you know every one of His disciples died as a martyr's death except the possibility of one? Every one of them died because of their faith. But, if you read their lives and their death, you can be absolutely certain that not one died in fear. Not one. He said, fear not. Go tell my brethren, that they go unto Galilee and there shall they see me. What a wonderful message. Don't be afraid. Go tell. I want to say to you as Christians, don't be afraid. Go tell. Go tell people what, who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for you. By the way, being a witness is telling somebody what God has done for you. Not that you know everything in the Bible. Some are afraid to be a witness because they're afraid somebody's going to ask me a question I can't answer. They're going to ask anybody questions that nobody can answer, but I can answer the most important one. Salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. That's the answer we have. We don't need to be a theologian and know everything that's in this book. Just tell people what you know. It don't take me long to do that. Just tell them what you know. Go tell them and tell my brethren that they go unto Galilee, and there shall see me. Now, verse 11, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. Some of those guys who were evidently that were knocked unconscious or chose to be at whatever happened there, they went back to the chief priests and said, Listen, boy, some strange things have happened. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave, I love this word, large money. If there's anything in the world that will tempt the devil himself is large money. And he said, we need to tell these guys, give these guys something that will substantiate this because if they go make a false witness and it's found out, they'll lose their life. So you better put the bribe on big time. He gave it to the soldiers. And they said, say ye, his disciples came by night, stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. You know what they're saying? We'll back you up, guys. Don't worry about it. How many of you have heard that? If anybody goes to prison, guess who it would have been? It wouldn't have been those who gave them the large money. Verse 15, So they took the money and did as they were taught. And as this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until the day. Look at the last meeting I'll be able to spend time with you on right quick. Then the eleven disciples went away unto Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Isn't that an amazing thing to find right there? Some doubted. Here was Christ. He was alive again. They saw Him before He died. They knew that He died. Now here He is alive again. I love the currency of the Word of God. They don't hide, it doesn't hide anything. It puts it right out front. There's some doubters. There's doubters everywhere you go. Amen? But that doesn't change who He is or who you are. Only you can let them change who you are. So He said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. All authority is in me now. And I want you to do this. Go ye therefore are for this reason. And teach all nations. 
the whole world. We're not just responsible for Highway 20 and, and up and down the road in Tallahassee and, and the United States of America. We're challenged with the whole world for the gospel. Go tell all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them, and listen to this illustration, teaching them to watch you so they'll know how to be a Christian. That's what the word observe says. Go ye therefore. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. How long? Even to the end of the world. I've leaned on that so many times. The promise that God would never leave me. How many times have you been in so many places and you felt like, God, where are you? I mean, my world's upside down. What in the world's going on? I, I just don't understand. And the only thing I can tell you, I can't tell you why you're where you are. I don't have all the explanations. But I know if you belong to Him, He's made you a promise. You will have difficulties. You will have problems. But you'll never go through it by yourself. He says, I'm going to be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Unto the end of the world. Here's what I want to leave with you this morning on this great resurrection day of 2015. I'm surely of the opinion that if we see resurrection day of 2016, it'll just be because God isn't through with us yet. There's so many things going on now that would, you know, we had a, had a blood moon just this past week. We'll have another one in September along with, and I'm not going to go into all the signs, but folks, let's j just lift up your heads. You can see it around you. You can see it. You can feel that something's going on. There's no way you can't deny it is there. And I, I know this. I know the Bible makes it plain that no man will know the day nor the hour when Christ will return. Even Christ said that He didn't know the Father. He chose not to have it revealed to Him. But I do know this. He gave us a lot of signs in this book. And He said, when you see these signs, lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. Could I echo that? Let me put it this way. If, you don't have, if you're not sure you have a living relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, I beg you to consider the possibility before you leave this room. Because if you put it off one more day, that's all the devil wants. Give, you, give him one more 24 hours to get you somewhere so he can take you out into eternity without Jesus Christ. That's his desire. And by the way, when you get in your vehicle to go either way on this highway, you're only about three feet away from certain death. That's how close. You're only one, in fact, in America today and in Tallahassee today, you're about one anger man or woman away from being shot dead. We've got a crazy society today. But all of that would tell me more. I want to make sure I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you know that you're a Christian, then let me ask you this question. Are you... Are you looking and you're waiting for God to come down and show you some kind of, some kind of something? That, and God's not going to do that. He's given you the revelation of this book. And will you take this book and ask God to help you be the kind of Christian that would make God proud? Just the kind of Christian that would make God proud. We're going to ask you to bow your head and ask our ladies to come back. and We're going to have an invitation at the end of the service. If you'd bow your heads with us, please. And Father, I thank you today for your wonderful, wonderful book that we find all these great truths in. And Lord, I'd ask that you'd validate those truths today. And if there's some here, Lord, that have not trusted you as Lord and Savior, today will be a great day, God. What a great day to celebrate giving your life to Christ, that resurrection day. And Lord, for us Christians that are here today, I pray we've been challenged to go tell what you've left us with. Go tell what you've left us with. Would you stand with us, please? And I ask Brother Tony to lead us.
in just two verses of a great old song. Sing with me, if you will, and I'm meeting you at the front if you'd like to come and give your life to Christ, or you'd like to come for prayer that your life might be on, on target for God. Please come. I'll be more than happy to pray with you.